good morning. Uh, today I'll be going into the aircraft flight instruments and navigation equipment. Uh, there's a lot to go over, so we're going to jump right into it. First off, we're going to go into the why. Why is it important to understand um, the flight instruments and not only what information they're giving you, but how they work, which is what we're going to go into a little bit today. It's important to know that because as aviators and pilots, when you're flying an aircraft, Obviously, you need to understand what the instruments are saying to you, what your airspeed is, but you also need to know how that instrument works because when you get erroneous errors and stuff, um, you need to figure out why is it doing this so you can be able to troubleshoot so that you can terminate a flight in the safest manner possible. Uh, we'll be going over the pitostatic system, the SI altimeter VSI, then we'll be going over the gyroscopic systems, uh, and then the magnetic compass and AHARs. And then we'll be going over ground-based and air-based navigation equipment. So let's jump right into it because we have a lot to uh, chew. So first, we're going to go uh, through the pitostatic system. Um, how this works is we have our altimeter. Put that up here. We have our VSI, vertical speed indicator. And we have our uh, airspeed indicator. Each of these are connected to the static port which in our Cessna, you can see right on the side of the plane. Uh, if I was with the student, I'd take them out there and show them where it is. And then we have our pitot tube, which has a hole here and then a little drain hole uh, in the back. And then um, this air connects. So our pitot tube simply goes to our airspeed indicator. Uh, it doesn't go anywhere else. And then we have our static port, which goes to our airspeed indicator our BSI, and our altimeter. So the very basics of all the pitostatic systems is indications are derived by pressure differentials. So for our altimeter, we have a uh, diaphragm, a uh, metal one, aneroid wafer, and inside of uh, this instrument, there's the aneroid wafer and that has um, standard uh, pressure which is uh, 29.92 inches of mercury. And if uh, you are at sea level on a standard day, which is 15 degrees Celsius, standard pressure, um, this altimeter would read zero. Um, if you were to go higher than that, um, there would be less air molecules and therefore the air would be less dense, causing the aneroid wafer to expand. This expansion would cause gears to uh, cause the indicator to move up um, and give you your higher altitude reading. Um, so for this, uh, we also have, because everything's not standard, we have a Colesman window. What you do is you put the uh, reading in that you get from your ATIS um, at every airport, not every airport, but most airports give them out, and it will give you uh, better readings. We have our uh, vertical speed indicator, which is very similar to this. However, instead of telling you what altitude you're at, it basically tells you what altitude you were at and what altitude you are at, and then it calculates the difference by having an anoid wafer with a calibrated leak. This calibrated leak um, lets air out, and it shows the difference between the outside, what the pressure uh, is, and inside what the pressure uh, was. Then we have our airspeed indicator, which shows the dif differential between the static um, pressure and the ram air pressure. The ram air pressure comes in here, and um, depending on how much is in there, uh, it pushes um, against a tab, and will that tab will either increase or decrease uh, the needle showing the airspeed. And then for this, we have our air data computer. We have our standbys, which uh, run off of this, but for our air data computer, it displays basically all the information we need on our uh, pitostatic system on the G1000. Let's go next into our um, the errors that can come from these. We'll go very quickly into them. Let's say um, for our airspeed indicator, if your static port is blocked, simply what will happen is the differential pressure from this to here will always be the same because the whole system um, for the static pressure is blocked, so you'll have, if you go at a higher altitude, it won't be as accurate, but it's not as big of an issue. However, the issue comes when you get the ram air hole uh, blocked. That 
uh, will allow, will cause the airspeed indicator to read zero. And then you will not have an airspeed indicator. If you get everything blocked for the airspeed indicator, it will read um, like an altimeter. So the higher you go, the higher airspeed, which uh, can be dangerous. So it's important uh, to know this if you were to get into icing conditions or even a bug um, could come in and fly in. Next, we're going to go into our gyroscopic uh, the danger of our attitude indicator, heading indicator, and turn indicator. Um, for us, in the G1000, we have AHARS and uh, a magnetometer to help with this, but we'll go quickly into the, how the gyroscope works. We have uh, rigidity. Oh, let me erase this quickly. We have rigidity and precession. So the principle of rigidity goes towards the attitude indicators and the heading indicator. This simply, in very lay terms, is if a uh, cylindrical disc or something is spinning very fast, it will tend to stay in the same exact place, um, even when acted on by an outside force because of the force that it has um, itself. So for our attitude indicator, this can help us when we have um, this would be the gyroscope here, and here is what it's on, and then we have what we call gimbals, which allows the aircraft to rotate around the gyroscope. On the front, we have a synthetic horizon, which tells us where the horizon is. So um, when this is spinning, the aircraft can move around it, and uh, it will show where uh, the horizon is to us. So if we happen to uh, go down and drop a pencil, we pick it up and we accidentally bump the controls and now we're facing down and we're in clouds and can't see where we are. Uh, this instrument allows us to see uh, our reference uh, to the horizon but via the synthetic horizon. Next we have our heading indicator. Um, this also is on the principle of rigidity. Um, this, uh, really quickly, how it works is it's spinning. Your aircraft constantly is moving around it. This also has four gimbals, which allows it the aircraft to move freely around the spinning uh, gyroscope. And what happens is you can set it to your magnetic compass when you're in straight and level flight. The magnetic compass will give you, um, show you where you are, but it has some uh, issues that we'll go into a little bit later. And this will allow you when you're turning to give a more accurate uh, description of which way you're facing. Um, a problem with this that I actually had when I was training back at my flight school is um, this other forces act on it. Unfortunately, the gyroscope isn't a perfect mechanism. And a lot of times on, with wear and tear, they become um, worse and worse. And usually they say every 15 minutes, according to the uh, PHAC. However, with the plane I flew, Every six or seven minutes, you would really have to adjust the heading indicator um, to make sure it gave accurate um, indications. And then we'll just quickly go into uh, how the G1000 works. The G1000 has AHARs, which are uh, much, much more uh, precise with their readings and accelerometers. Uh, these are located in the back tail of the plane, and uh, they just display everything on the G1000. Um, without the gyroscopes, and this allows the plane um, to have more accurate readings. Um, we'll go quickly along into uh, the magnetic compass. This is pretty simple. Um, all of us as kids have little magnetic compasses that we'd want to follow north. I was always fascinated by them. But in the airplane, uh, we have uh, magnetic compasses which uh, allow us to find uh, true north. I mean north, uh, there's a problem with magnetic compasses. True north and magnetic north are different. So uh, that's an issue we find uh, with that. Let me go quickly. Um, some other errors is deviations. Um, our electrical equipment in the aircraft can cause magnetic fields, which can cause the uh, magnetic compass to turn, um, not to certain ways, another way. Um, that all magnetic compasses have is uh, 
deviation card right below it that will help you understand uh, better what the compass is really saying. Then we have dipping errors. Unfortunately, the magnetic field uh, runs parallel to the Earth's surface only at the equator. So the compass will slightly dip, and then this is what causes um, our unosis or undershoot north, overshoot south. So when you're turning, and uh, you're turning to our northerly heading, I want to make sure I get this right. Um, and this is also on the private pilot test. Um, when you, during a turn to a southerly heading, the compass uh, indicator will turn um, in a southerly direction. However, it will turn faster than normal. So that's why you want to undershoot it. And then vice versa with the north. Um, hmm? You're at 11 minutes. 11 minutes, okay. So um, next we're going to go into our navigation equipment. So all this, again, you can find in uh, chapter nine of the instrument flying handbook. We're going to go have ground based and air based. So VORs, uh, we're going to quickly end. My instructor taught me VORs are like, basically like a bicycle a spoke. Imagine you have a bicycle. This is the center of the bicycle wheel. And then you have its spokes. There's 360 spokes for every direction. We have our CDI, which tells you where you are in uh, relation to uh, a radial off of this. So if you are right of course, the CDI will show you um, that the course is over here and that your aircraft is to the right of it. Um, how you are able to tune in to a VOR frequency is there's the bandwidth of, I want to make sure I get this eight, one, zero, eight point zero. Um, yes, 108.0 to 117.95. And when you tune into that frequency, uh, you can listen to it and it will give you a certain Morse code frequency for each. So you listen for the dot dash um, to make sure you have the correct one. I remember when I was doing my private training, I uh, once connected to uh, the wrong VOR and um, I didn't know this for a while. My instructor let me do it and I was for about 15 minutes and then I realized I was off course. So it's always very important to identify um, that. Um, then we have our NBDs. We'll quickly go into that. Those are really, really simple. Instead of getting off radials from uh, like VORs, NBD simply uses an ADF omnidirectional finder to point where the station is. So if this was uh, an NBD, you would simply have an ADF that pointed to where the aircraft was uh, in relation to the NBD. Then we have an ILS. We'll go into this quickly. Um, ILSs are used for approaches. Um, they allow lateral guidance like a VOR. They'll show you where in relation you are to a course. And then they'll also give uh, vertical guidance or a glide slope. This glide slope will allow you to come down and they're used for instrument uh, uh, landings and approaches. Next we have air-based, air-based or GPS is what is uh, now uh, changing the avi aviation industry more and more. Um, how GPS works is if there are three, you get a 2D uh, image positioning of where you are. And if there's four uh, GPSs um, that are connected to your GPS system, you get a 3D image. So that means not only would you get your lateral location on the earth, but you'd also get your altitude. Um, to be more precise, we have a thing called RAIM, uh, which includes five. The reason, uh, reason why you have it is, uh, the four will give you the position and then that fifth satellite, uh, will give you, if there are, uh, any, uh, problems or errors with any of the calculations, the fifth satellite will be able to figure that out. Um, uh, that's going through all of, um, our instruments. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of time to be able to go through it, but I hope you learned as much as possible. If there's any issues or if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and ask, and these two chapters will be able to go even in more depth over these instruments. Um, have a great day, and thanks for watching.